So I'll just continue to talk until I get another stop. All right, so yeah, I'm presenting here a work that's together with Joel Waldfogel uh, about just kind of how digitization has changed uh, how public libraries function. So just as a heads up here, uh, we're talking about public libraries, not so much about like university or educational libraries. Uh, as we think about there we go. Right. If we go back in time just a little bit about you know what libraries were and how they actually uh, you know what what they do for us. Right. Very generally, we kind of think you know in the world of uh, you know information and innovation. Right. Information dis diffusion is incredibly important. And actually, libraries have always played quite a large role in in facilitating this diffusion of information. So we can kind of think of libraries as these places where people come together. Uh, to make right, well shared use of books. Uh, now, in the you know in the twentieth century, kind of starting with the Carnegie libraries, uh, we've seen this large growth in the number of libraries uh, that are available. And actually, let me just grab a laser pointer, just in case. Right. <laughs> yes, exactly. So, um, for those of you who have been to Boston, right, this is the Boston Pu Public Library. It's also really interesting because it has this little inscription that says that, you know, it's dedicated to the advancement of learning. Uh, and that's really kind of a big part of libraries, right? And, and so, uh, really, by 2010, we've had about 16,000 libraries or public libraries in the US. Uh, the picture here just kind of shows the growth from 1990 up until 2010 in both the number of visits per capita. So by now, there's about, on average, an American goes to a library about five times a year on average. And also uh, the circulation, which is just the number of books that are um, actually checked out at libraries, also has increased a lot between, say, 1990 and 2010, but it's also increased a, much, a ton before 1990. Uh, so now one reason why these libraries actually were able to, to grow so much is because of a part of the copyright law that has facilitated this. There's this copyright law that's called, or this part of this, this, this uh, first sale doctrine, um, which allows, which basically says that everybody, like once you bought a copy, you can do with it whatever you want. Um, so what, you know, and one, one thing that this has also facilitated is things like Redbox, where Redbox could buy a copy of a DVD and then they could just, you know, rent it out to as many people as they wanted to. And the same idea with, uh, you know, libraries where essentially every physical uh, copy, librarians pay exactly as much as we would as regular consumers. Um, now, of course, that also, uh, you know, opens the door for potential sales cannibalization. And that is something, of course, that, uh, you know, uh, publishers might be worried about. Now, with the uh, arrival of ebooks, uh, the role of libraries has also changed a little bit. So what we get now is, you know, with the technology that, you know, of ebooks, it's, it's quite possible that we no longer need or that libraries no longer function as an institution for people to get together. Very generally, it's because, uh, well, people no longer have to go to a library to actually check out a book. They can just do it from, you know, from their phone, from home, anything like that. Now, uh, what actually happened in response to this uh, to this change in technology, this the arrival of the ebooks, which really kind of happened in 2008, is that uh, you know a lot of libraries actually kind of adopted this hybrid model. On one hand, they you know they continue to offer physical uh, books and places for people to get together. In fact, they might have even expanded the uh, areas for people to actually get together in the libraries. Um, but they also offer ebooks, so uh, you know consumers or patrons can kind of choose between the two formats. Now, by 2018, ebooks have actually accounted for about 36% of entire library expenditures and also about 14% of circulation. Now, one might wonder why you know, it's not more than 14% or why it's so much more on expenditure. Well, one reason why maybe the expenditure of libraries has been quite, on, uh, of ebooks has been quite high is the fact that this first sale doctrine that I mentioned doesn't apply to ebooks, right? So, whereas for physical books, librarians have to, like, librarians get to pay the exact same price as consumers. That's not the case for ebooks. In fact, um, and for that reason, ebook prices have always been quite high. So, I'm giving you this one example. Actually, yeah. Eric? So, that ratio to expenditures looks like the circulation is much less. So yeah. Who's a ratio to titles? Is, I imagine most libraries have a big stock of titles they bought over the past. 
Um, that's right. So, of course, the, the ratio of titles and uh, books that are available. Yeah, okay. So I'll, I should repeat the question probably also. Um, yeah, so, so there's, of course, this, this uh, connection between the number of titles that are available and the expenditures where, where physical books have been available for many years. Now, of course, at some or have, like, have been in holdings, in stock at the library for many years. Yeah, that's, that's true. It turns out, of course, physical books also don't last for eternity. They will also have to be uh, exchanged at some point. But that's, yeah, we'll, we'll look especially at the holdings. So this was more of just a, a little bit of a, like an, a motivating example of just, you know, how, how big of a part uh, library expenditures on ebooks are playing. We'll go into more detail on that. Now, one thing is, though, that, you know, that also is really quite striking. You know, I'm, I'm not, like, this is not, the example that I have here for this book by Anthony Durr, you know, All the Light We Cannot See, um, that one, if we were to go on Amazon and pay for it, we'd pay $12.99 for the ebook version of this book. Um, now, libraries, in fact, have to pay $51.99 for the same book. And in addition, it's not even that they can then do with that book whatever they want to. They, in fact, only get a two year license for those book, for that book, and they can only check it out one book at a time. So they kind of like emulate the system of the physical book, but apply, uh, uh, but at a much higher price. Um, so that's always been the case. And this isn't even, uh, this, is, this isn't even an outlier really. On average, and this is based on, um, you know, the price is quoted to um, Multnomah County Library in Oregon, um, that the average price that they pay for a library, for a print book is about $14. The average for eBooks is $45. So large difference for basically the same service. Now, in fact, it gets even worse now, though. So, you know, we have these embargoes where, for example, Macmillan, in the first eight weeks after a book has been published, only uh, allows one, each library to only uh, get at, at most one copy of the book. And so the CEO of Macmillan here, uh, John Sargent, says, you know, in today's digital world, there is no such friction in the market, meaning for physical books, at least pa library patrons still have to go to the library, uh, have you know, like a, pro a probability of having to incur some kind of late fees if they don't turn it in, turn it back in on time. None of those frictions are there anymore. So they argue that there's a little bit of a concern for devaluing the experience of reading a book toward uh, consumers. Uh, in addition, Amazon Publishing, you know, refuses to license eBooks to uh, to libraries altogether. So you know, for for libraries. It's not so much the, the smiley uh, Amazon publishing, but more like a frowny face Amazon publishing. So exactly, thank you for laughing. <laughs> this is why I'm doing this in person, right? Okay, so, you know, as a response, and this is kind of, you know, what, what I'm trying to argue here is also, right? So the response by the American Library Association in 2019 uh, was that, you know, they said that restricting access you know, hurts discovery, hurts reading choice, hurts literacy, right? And so in a sense, and this is kind of, you know, the first digital challenge that we might be talking about here in this paper is that ebooks aren't available enough to libraries, just to kind of set the tone on, on that end. Um, now, on the other hand, however, we do have this problem or potential problem that when we have a lot of ebooks, well, one, the first point I already mentioned that it might devalue books in the eyes of consumers, um, which is more of an argument on the, uh, on the publisher side but also it might undermine just general library use and hence this formation of social capital that we really get from people gathering in the same place to exchange or to learn about something right exchange information and here is just you know and this has been kind of an argument that's that several people several commenters and so on have made i'm just listening this uh, listing this one here by Klinenberg. the future of democratic societies rests not simply on shared values but on shared spaces the libraries and other stuff where crucial connections are formed. So with this in mind, uh, I showed you kind of a graph of uh, use um, of, of libraries, you know, between 1990 and 2010. Here is the same graph, but uh, continuing from 2010 to 2020, which is what we have data for. And we see a drop both in visits and circulation over that period. Now, I want to be clear. Nowhere here do I actually claim any causal relationship between like the existence of ebooks and library visits, but there is some kind of correlation. Uh, so with this kind of in mind, if you know if, if ebooks obviate the, the, the need to go to a library, then maybe 
it, it's actually the case that if we have any ebooks in libraries, then ebooks become too available. Um, so, you know, because they they prevent this accumulation of social capital. So with these two kind of counteracting or, you know, um, yeah, counteracting, I guess, um, you know, opinions, the real, like the question that we'll try to answer in this paper is uh, briefly just how do ebooks and especially the ebook access terms that publishers uh, impose on the libraries, how do they affect libraries, consumers, and social capital formation? Uh, now, the way that we'll actually get to this is in a couple of steps. So we'll kind of see how well this works with the timing, but uh, I'll start by providing just a very simple theoretical framework. Now I say simple framework, and whenever I say that, that means it's pretty simple, because uh, that's what I can do. <laughs> but basically I'll try to kind of connect or, or create a connection between library holdings and like the consequences of that for consumer utility. And I'll explain a lot of that, a little bit of that in a little bit as well. Um, well, then the main part of this paper is obviously kind of a data driven analysis. Uh, so we'll have library year format level data on holdings, circulation and visits. And we'll do a bunch with that. First, we'll have some kind of descriptive analysis where we just kind of look at how much library holdings of physical and ebooks affect circulation and also visits to a library overall. Uh, then we'll kind of take all of that and move it to a, a structural model, again, a simple structural model, where we'll uh, explicitly model kind of the, you know, the patron demand for books and their ability or their willingness to substitute between different formats and the librarian's choice of holdings. And this structure then allows us to run some counterfactual analyses where we can model maybe, you know, even higher ebook prices uh, for libraries or other kinds of levels of, uh, of how publishers might restrict uh, access to library uh, to, to ebooks for libraries. Uh, to kind of get the main takeaway slightly early and you know not have to not to make you wait you know an entire 45 minutes or so to get it to get the takeaway. Um, really what, what we kind of learned from our analysis is that library ebook restrictions have really quite quite a small effect on consumer surplus. And in fact, they do have a positive effect on library visits. And the idea here is basically that uh, consumers are quite willing to substitute between ebooks and physical books, and therefore restricting ebooks doesn't really hurt consumers all that much. Um, but with the, all of that said, I actually want to kind of, you know, not just tell you the answer, also I want to convince you that that actually is what we, what we find. So to start off, um, I'm, currently teaching intermediate microeconomics. So everything I do is in terms of microeconomics, intermediate microeconomics. So here we've got some indifference curves um, and a budget constraint. But really, so the way that I wanna think of this, right? So whether library ebook restrictions are actually harmful to library patrons is, is, is gonna depend essentially on how much consumers are willing to substitute between physical books and ebooks, as I already mentioned, and also the librarians understanding about what the consumers want. So the way that we kind of think about this is first of all that you know circulation is going to depend on library holdings of both ebook and physical book formats. Um, and then consumers are going to derive utility from circulation. Now here I'm putting this somewhat simply. I'm kind of thinking of this, you know, this library budget constraint, which is essentially just whatever librarians are able to buy in terms of holdings of ebooks and physical books. Now, just as a little bit of a heads up uh, in, you know, for the sake of this example, uh, you know, if we look at the intercepts here with the 50 and 100, again, made up numbers, but, but really we are kind of thinking of maybe given costs of, uh, you know, staffing and of, uh, you know, of, of just um, capacity and so on, we're going to kind of treat as treat ebooks as twice as expensive as physical books. Now, that's a little bit made up. I'll tell you already that that doesn't matter, that it doesn't really matter what kind of ratio we use here. But what we see is then for the you know, patron utility, it's, it's something or you know, the circulation given diminishing marginal returns will have some kind of you know, concave or convex shaped indifference curve here. And I see a question. Is there any data on how many times a person read, like what the cost per reading is. Like if an ebook is read five times and a regular book is read 10 times, that would be different than if the regular book was read 
twice. So, so do you have a sense of what the cost is per time a person? So, um, I mean, one can definitely calculate the like the cost per instance of circulation. Um, we haven't done that. Uh, I mean, it's, it's easy to do because we actually observe both the holdings and the circulation. So I'm pretty sure I can pretty easily calculate that in about three slides. Um, How about a qualitative version? Do you know whether ebooks are, are circulate more or less than? They are much. They're circulated much less. Much less. Much per, less. Per so copy. per per holding, ebooks are circulated much less than physical books. So that would make, in yeah. some sense, the, the even more expensive. Even more expensive per circulation. Yes, that is correct. Thank you for helping me work this through. Exactly. I was gonna go there in, in the uh, when I show you the summary slides, but exactly. That's so. So we're keeping it here as kind of a cost per holding. The cost per circulation is basically just going to tell the same story. So, um, but what we'll see is essentially so as we understand from our intermediate micro that if so, so essentially the library has a choice between you know uh, among any of these points here on the budget constraint, right? And if their libraries, if the libraries were doing a good job um, maximizing the consumer's utility, what would happen is that they would kind of choose this point right here. Where we have the, you know, where, where the library, uh, where the consumers get onto the highest possible indifference curve. Now, what could though happen instead is something like this. Maybe uh, libraries tend to stock, quote unquote, too many physical holdings and not enough ebook holdings. In that case, well, essentially, if we were to restrict ebooks even more, that can only be bad for consumers. But if instead, uh, librarians um, kind of con you know uh, hold or have holdings of ebooks and physical books that are you know essentially where we have too many ebooks and not enough physical books. Then what could happen is if we restrict the ebook terms even further, which is essentially kind of like a pivot of this budget constraint um, to you know kind of inward, uh, then it is possible if the print holdings increase. That in fact consumers could benefit from uh, from stronger restrictions on ebooks, right? And so, so that is something that we'll kind of look into. Now, speaking more practically for us, what what we can actually get from this is if we actually look at just the you know essentially the derivative of circulation per holding for physical books and the circulation of holding uh, per holding of ebooks. You know, if, if the if the derivative for the physical books is larger than the derivative for ebooks, taking into account that maybe physical books are even cheaper than ebooks, then um, that suggests that we're somewhere down here, and libraries essentially assign one could say too much weight on ebooks versus physical books. So so that's very generally just kind of the framework that I'd like us to to think about. Uh, with that framework, I'll move on to to a little bit of a like a descriptive analysis. But I also see that there might be no. No, you're just playing with the microphone. Okay. I'm not sure, I'll ask. I, no. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's another case. Suppose that they were at, at close to the optimum yeah. previously. Then, if there's a small change, you're going to have a, a very. It's going to have almost no effect on welfare. So, by the envelope theorem, you're not yeah. going to. It's not going to matter too much. So, if they're close yeah. to the optimum. That also suggests there's not much of an effect. Right? That's actually that's a good point. Yeah, uh, exactly. So far, we've kind of just thought about you know big differences, but really, if we're close to the optimum, and in fact, as I already indicated, we'll find very small effects on consumers, and that might be it as well. So uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, so with all of that said, jumping into the data now. Now the data set that we have, as I said, is is essentially so. So actually, we get this from the Institute of Museum and Library Services, the IMLS. Uh, they run an annual public library survey, and we use information from that survey. So overall, we actually observe uh, 8,414 US library systems, and we keep track of them from 2013 to 2019. Idea is 2013 is the first time that uh, ebook holdings and circulation is um, reported. 2019 was the last year that we could get data for. Um, we have all US states, and this map essentially just shows you that the libraries in our data set are located where people are located, so at least we have somewhat of a potentially representative data set of all of the libraries. Um, given that we don't observe all libraries in every year, we have a total of about 50,000 and well close to 51,000 uh, observations for library and year. Um, now the data that we actually have 
I mean, it sounds wonderful. At least we have a lot of uh, we at least we have a lot of uh, libraries. Um, for each library, the data that we actually observe are one. We actually observe like the library visits. Now, these are of course reported library visits, but assume that these are accurately reported. Now, as we already saw, they are decreasing over time. Um, in addition. We see for each library year and book format, physical and ebook, uh, we see the holdings, the circulation, and the expenditure. So, uh, very generally speaking, for ebooks, not too surprisingly, the like everything increases over time. And in fact, we kind of show the percent change in holdings, so the year over year percent change in holdings, on average is about 26%. So we have large increases in the library ebook holdings, and uh, we don't have that. For physical books. Now, uh, Eric already asked the question about uh, the, you know, kind of the the circulation per holding, and a simple math simple math here tells me that whereas the holdings for ebooks and print books are somewhat similar, or at least the same order of magnitude, the seventy eight thousand for print books and sixty three thousand for ebooks on average, the um, the circulation is an order of magnitude larger for physical books. So that kind of tells us a little bit about kind of the role of physical books here. Right? Uh, I see Sarah wants to ask a question. Is that? A, yeah. Um, do you have any? Oh, sorry. Yeah, uh, do you have any information on the patrons of the library? I think that, for example, you can imagine children not necessarily circulating ebooks, but people like us who travel yeah. relatively frequently might. Uh, want yeah. more access to ebooks. So I think to do a welfare analysis like you discussed earlier. Yeah, yeah no, thank you. Um, so we do observe, I mean, we know where the libraries are located. Now we don't know who checked out a book or who didn't, but we do know um, the, the location and we are matching the locations with demographics. So some information that's like, you know, at least, so not exactly children yet, but we've got like percent over 45 and percent over 65 and also percent with a bachelor's degree. And we have that information. Um, yeah, but like on the library side itself, this is essentially what we have. We have a little extra information, but we don't know who the patrons are. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, related to that, I mean, it might, mm -hmm. it might be interesting to break out like children's book. I mean, yeah. when I go to the library, often somebody will have a stack of 12, like very short children's books that all get checked out. I don't know if they yeah. count the same as one War and peace. <laughs> yes, exactly. And and children's books also tend to be yeah, exactly also war, war and peace. Anyway, that's a wonderful example of a book that nobody can read in two weeks. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so in fact, we do have some limited information about the checkouts of children's books, and we might be able to do something with that. So oh yeah, what about audiobooks? Yeah, we do observe. Uh, so we either observe um, the circulation of audiobooks separate from the others or holdings we don't observe both separate from the others so we're we're treating in fact and thanks for asking that um we're treating uh, currently like ebooks is in general electronic format stuff um it turns out that no actually i'm, I'm not quite sure but yeah i mean that's 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 how we treat them right now all right. So, so there are a couple of questions from online. Do you want to, yeah. you know? Uh, uh, that's, I mean, sure, if we, if we don't have to stop at uh, yeah. 12.45. Well, then. So these are. OK. Yeah, oh, OK, we'll, we'll, yeah. We'll, we'll, no, we'll manage your time. Yeah, because it would okay. be good also leave some time at the end. But, but sure. um, so let me just do these two quick ones. Yeah. Um, one from Linda Salman um, asks, um, if you have a, it, given that electronic circulation is so much lower than physical circulation, do you have a, a hypothesis, but what's motivating librarians to pour so much money into electronic books? Um, and and I'm, I'll give you the other one too. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. uh, 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 well, a couple other ones. Zhu Peng Wang asks, do you know it, which books have both physical and ebook versions? Yeah. And, and is that a consideration? And finally, a third one is um, um, ha have, have you been able to get data on? changes in library hours, budget cuts, fewer hours, et cetera, and whether that's right. driving some of the changes in, in visits. All right, uh, thank you for those questions. So the first one, 
I forgot. <laughs> no. First one was yeah. about why do you think that they're yeah, um, thank keeping you. e books um, if they don't if they have one tenth yeah. as much circulation. So 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 one one thing that we are thinking about is 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 that maybe they just get it wrong. There's a bit of the maybe they 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 really just get it wrong uh, that they think that ebooks are more popular among consumers than they actually are. Uh, there are of course other considerations as well that might be around uh, how much we um, uh, it's it's you know so so we kind of they, they might be more costly on it, like just for the purchase itself, but the costs of staffing and so on aren't necessarily really incorporated in that. Uh, so they might be a little cheaper. Than, than what we see if we just look at the list price. Now, still, that wouldn't make up the difference. So in, in a way, it's either essentially, and this is kind of how we're going to rationalize the holdings that we see, uh, is either they, they just get, get consumer preferences wrong, or they, for some other reason, really value the circulation of uh, e-books more than they might the circulation of physical books. Uh, so that's the first question. The other one, one was, um, what's the, if we observe books that are available both as physical and as e-books? Right. Um, thank you. Yeah. And um, so, so it turns out we actually don't observe title information. We literally just observe what is on this slide here that says how many books of each format we have. So we can't really go into uh, detail on that. Um, and then the third question was, all right, um, sorry. Um, hours oh, yeah, ours. Thank you. Uh, so we do observe staff expenditures. Um, we don't observe hours or something. It'd be nice to kind of learn as well if they had some, if, if there were some information or if we could really learn about how maybe librarians attempt to get consumers or patrons in the door some other ways. That's really hard to measure uh, in terms of our data that we have. It could be more of a qualitative part that we could add to it. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah. The, the ebooks could be sorry could be at risk of being circulated for a shorter period of time, given that most of them were added more recently. I mean, so so the circulation is data from starting in two thousand, and it's yeah. I mean, in, in reality, somewhere here we should have had an an, uh, an extra row maybe that's like circulation per expenditure, uh, sorry per holding, which we don't have. But uh, but other than that, at least this is. Well, actually, I mean, it probably won't make much of a difference as far as I can tell, right? In, in, in the sense that, um, you know, if we just compare the circulation with the holdings. But if the, if the print books were like available the whole 2013 to 2019 and the ebooks are growing at this 26% per yeah. year rate, then there's going to be a lot of the ebooks that were only yeah. added in like 2018 and then exactly. they're only at risk one year. Yeah. Now it turns out, I mean, these, these holdings are actually like, annual holdings right so in in 2013 that number is going to be lower and it's not like the the end holdings it's the annual holdings it's an annual average here so yeah and the same thing with the circulation so i think it's a bit of a it's these are actually annual data so yeah all right thank you for clara for asking that for clarifying or giving me a chance to clarify, clarify rather uh so to get you actually some some results here as well right so so first of all um, the first part that we really kind of want to do here is we kind of want to learn about the patterns in circulation and patronage. Again, kind of, if we think about back to the, um, you know, this simple uh, framework that I, that I presented a, little, a couple of minutes ago, uh, we kind of see this as a, um, you know, as, as a chance, you know, essentially, if, if we just kind of look at the, the change in uh, circulation as we change holdings. So the attempt that we're doing here and uh, keeping this Oh, yeah, this is what I wanted to do. So just as an example, if we have our, you know, circulation of physical books as the dependent variable, we can run a fixed effects model where we essentially try to estimate the circulation as a function of the holdings of physical books and the holdings of ebooks. And then the, you know, the coefficient on the holdings of physical books kind of tells us this marginal utility from one more print book and the beta E is going to give us some information about the substitution that consumers are willing to, uh, or that, that consumers are, are willing to do uh, between ebooks and physical books. Now, clearly, you know, we need some kind of fixed effects. So we have library fixed effects and um, time year fixed effects, also to account for the, you know, rise in ebooks as well. Um, so then, that's essentially what we'll do. Now, or that's kind of our first approach here um, in OLS. 
this, by the way, you know, this is clearly a straw man where we don't actually have library fixed effects. Not a big surprise that then, you know, basically libraries with more holdings also have more circulation. So what's more interesting is definitely this uh, fixed effects model here, which has library fixed effects in it. Now we do see neg negative cross effects, which su suggests that we have some cross format substitution. Now, what I want to focus on more here, because I really kind of just want to set the stage for the full model, is that we do see positive own effects. We see essentially that holdings attract use and also that the coefficient on physical is much larger than the coefficient on ebooks. So that kind of tells me, you know, kind of going, moving forward a little bit, that we're probably somewhere down here because that's, you know, that's essentially exactly what we, what we get from, from the model that we had. Now, this also adds a, you know, an instrumental variable approach. Now, instruments are hard to come by, turns out, but what we kind of use is just jumps and holdings. So just in the interest of time, I'll leave it at that, but essentially every once in a while we'll have like big jumps in holdings, especially for, uh, for ebooks, and uh, we can use those as somewhat exogenous because libraries often have to kind of buy the entire catalog of a, of a publisher. So that's, we'll just use that. Turns out the coefficients are very similar, right? So, so with that said, we can also do the same analysis here essentially for library visits. Again, kind of looking at, we at whether ebooks affect the accumulation of social capital. And so now here, the dependent variable is just gonna be like the, the library visits. And to just summarize what we see here, the highlighted uh, columns are the more interesting ones because they are not obviously flawed, only potentially flawed. Um, and here we've got kind of, you know, the this, this situation where more physical holdings are associated, you know, both with the fixed effects model and the IV model with the same strategy. Um, that, you know, physical holdings are associated with more visits and ebook holdings are associated with fewer visits. Uh, I see Abhishek has a question. Just on the previous uh, slide, and maybe there's a version of Chuck's question, you don't worry about differences in composition of the books themselves. Like, should we think about this as a library gets one physical book and one ebook for the same title? Yes. Or are they somehow getting the cheaper ebook titles and then the really best selling physical book titles? That might lead you to get a much yeah. larger coefficient on the one column than the other. Yeah, I mean, that is. So, so clearly that, that, that could be happening where it's essentially just that um, ebooks just, yeah, if, if we get uh, ebooks that nobody cares about, then that extra ebook isn't gonna make a big difference. Uh, we see very little evidence, evidence of that, or, but, but it's also really hard to, to test that, I think. So, so we do have access to one library where we can actually see the, the, at least the, the titles that they have. And I think it's probably worth looking into whether the quality of the titles or the uh, appeal of the ebook titles is, is different from, from the other ones. So we'll, I'll have a better answer to that next time we talk. <laughs> yeah, uh, okay, thank you. So, but what these results overall suggest and um, is that essentially that we have this, this world where libraries seem to hold too many ebooks, uh, you know, in, as indicated by the large coefficient on physical books versus uh, for physical holdings and circulation, and the small coefficient for ebooks and uh, ebook circulation, and also that if we hold too many ebooks, that tends to decrease library patronage. So both of those things together don't sound great. Now, what we don't know yet, at least, is how these how ebook restrictions, maybe restricting ebooks even further, or ebook uh, liberalizations could actually affect patron surplus. So in order to do that, we'll need a little more structure. And that's what we'll kind of do in, in the rest of uh, the talk today. And uh, so, so what I'll do is also, in, you know, with an eye on the time, is I'll at least give, give the intuition between, uh, behind the uh, simple structural model. So the idea is very simple, that we kind of have, like these, we're, we're gonna model both parts of this equation, right? So on one hand, we'll have consumers who value and may substitute between physical books and ebooks. Um, so what we'll do here is we will actually estimate the title format level demand uh, to identify how much consumers, one, value physical books, and two, are willing to substitute between physical books and ebooks versus substituting away from libraries altogether. Um, 
Secondly, we then kind of taking these substitution patterns, we'll think about the libraries and the libraries will kind of think of as, you know, these institutions that, that might value to get to one of the online questions as well, right? That they might value the circulation of physical books differently from the circulation of eBooks. Now we're gonna remain quite agnostic about why that might be or how exactly that happens. So we're kind of looking at the libraries more as a, like a reduced form, uh, you know, equation to kind of help us rationalize the, um, the observed holdings that we have. Uh, so, but basically given the format specific prices, which we mostly assume, uh, we can assign essentially library utility weights that would explain these holdings. Uh, and then we, you, we add both of these parts together in an equilibrium where we essentially have both demand patterns and library, and, uh, library utility weights that would then estimate holdings in different counterfactual scenarios. So for example, we can raise the ebook prices and see what happens as a consequence of that. Um, now, I'm happy to talk later about the actual estimation, I think, but I think, uh, in terms of just you know really trying to get the point across, I'll just kind of give a give a brief overview, right? So so on the demand side, we will estimate this two-level nested logit model of demand, which I'm kind of describing and uh, trying to describe here, as where the consumer essentially you know in the in the first nest they decide whether they want to go use the, see the library, go to the library at all, or not, and then conditional on going to the library, they get to choose if they want to check out an ebook or a physical book. And once they've made that decision, they can then choose which book they want. Now that's of course simplified a little bit. In reality, we're only using the setup to, to be able to get kind of the correlation of tastes within a format versus across formats versus away from libraries altogether. And I'll show in the results how we'll interpret that. Now, the model is essentially gonna, is gonna give us these correlations between the formats. Um, as well as the correlation within a format. Now in order, and these are the two terms that we'll really care about. And all of that is just designed for us to, to really explain or describe the, uh, the substitution patterns. Now this turns out to be difficult to estimate, mostly because you know, we don't actually see individual books checkouts. So we'll have to make a couple of assumptions. Um, but again, in the interest of time, I'm very happy to talk about those, I think, uh, later, right? But it's, it's, we're not the first ones to deal with it this way, so um, that's, that's all I'll have. What's more interesting here is um, the actual results. So we, I'm showing you here what I really kind of want to focus on, right? We've got something without instruments, so we shouldn't, probably shouldn't believe that very much. I'm showing you a first stage, and the fourth column is really the preferred model where we have you know instruments for the inside shares and so on as well so the first thing that i want to see uh, or i want to show is that consumers seem to like physical books so these are the coefficients on whether it's an ebook and those are negative throughout you know throughout all specifications so consumers seem to like physical books now yeah that's that's essentially that and more interesting probably still is that we see quite large substitution patterns so we've got, uh, sorry, so substitution parameters. So what these coefficients here mean, one thing that we can see is that they're quite close to one. That means there's a very high correlation of, of tastes. So to start with the sigma, which we call sigma bottom, that tells us the correlation of tastes across books within a format. We see a really large number here with the 9 point, uh, 0.94 essentially. That really says that, you know, if we remove a couple of physical books, then consumers are just going to substitute to other physical books. There's not going to be all that much variation across formats. Now, we still have a pretty high coefficient, though, across the formats as well. So conditional on, like, if you do switch between, um, you know, from one format to another, you're quite likely to sw actually switch to the other format rather than to switch away from libraries altogether. So in fact, what this tells me is that if we change holdings in general in any way the total library circulation isn't going to be affected all that much that's what we learned from this um, now we add to this the librarian utility now i'll make this I'll, I'll just kind of yes okay i got a question can you just remind us so what's the time frame on that for the substitution is that within the same year or um yeah so i guess i could imagine that 
that somebody goes to the library and they're in the habit of going and if they don't find sure. their favorite yeah. fiction author, they get a different one. Yeah. But over time, if there's not what they're looking for, they stop going to the library. Yeah. So that's a, good, uh, that's a good question. So in general, we do have year fixed effects in this model that I'm not showing. So that kind of makes it you know, within, within a year and also across years, in fact, right? So we have fixed effects for both libraries and time in this model. Um, so, so overall time trends are to some, to, at least to some degree captured just by the, um, uh, by these, uh, time fixed effects, I think, right? Um, uh, yeah, we, yeah, we can talk more about it. All right. Yeah. Uh, exactly. Now, of course, overall, over time, there, there might be a, a different long-term elasticity than a short-term elasticity. And I think that's what you're getting at. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, that'll be hard to measure, I think. Uh, yeah. Okay. But thank you. I'll keep that in mind as well. So uh, yeah. Anyway, on the library side, right? Essentially, what we'll think about is that these librarians are going to choose some combination of holdings, subject to their budget constraint and the prices of ebooks and physical books, that maximize some weighted sum of circulation. So essentially, we'll think of like the librarian's utility as you know, some linear function of the quantity or the circulation of physical books and some weighted amount of the circulation of the ebooks. Uh, so what we can do is we can basically, you know, maximize this utility function by just finding, you know, setting the derivatives with respect to the holdings equal to zero, right? Just a general maximization function. So then given prices, which we kind of treat as data, and quantities, which we get from the demand estimation, we can essentially back out this weighting parameter theta. And uh, that tells us essentially how much people or how much libraries value circulation of ebooks beyond what consumers value circulation of ebooks. So this formula here, this equation, just looks a little bit, of, a little bit painful, but it's really just a equal marginal principle formula. Um, now, we already, from the reduced form, we already learned that chances are that uh, librarians really value ebook circulation. It turns out our model gives us that as well. In fact, on average, uh, librarians seem to value circulation of ebooks about nine times as much as physical books. Uh, but there is, a, you know, it's a bit of a skewed distribution where the median is about three times as large. Um, so, but with all of this, and I'm keeping an eye on the time, I realize that, um, but with all of that, if, yeah, if I may, I'll probably go like five minutes over, right? We had a couple of questions already, so we'll go with that. Also, who's going to stop me? No. Just, um, okay, so, uh, so what we get, right? So, so just to get to the interesting part now, right? So, so what we're wondering is, what if we change the policies? What if we make ebook access more restrictive? How does that affect, one, holdings and circulation, two, consumer and librarian utility, and three, visits to the library? So the things that I'll focus on uh, in particular are, are these, these sets of counterfactuals. So first, and that's the thing that I'll focus on the most, is this idea that we can restrict uh, ebooks further. <laughs> um, and you know, so for example, and this is just kind of what I'll show at first, is you know, as we remove ebooks entirely from libraries, move back to a world pre-2010, um, and then maybe what's most interesting is kind of this world where you know, ebook prices are going to increase even further because that's most likely going to happen soon. And then finally, what I'll also show is kind of, you know, what happens if librarians change their preferences, making them more aligned with consumer preferences, right? If librarians just get it wrong, let's force them to get it right, see what happens. Uh, and so I'll start just with the first example, just to kind of show how we set up these, uh, these counterfactuals. So uh, if we remove ebooks entirely, then, you know, and keep the number of physical holdings constant, that shows us basically, you know, the value of holdings for physical books is going to be the same, so one relative to the baseline, but we have no ebook holdings. Um, we can, based on, based on the demand model, we can then calculate the counterfactual circulation. We'll find that physical circulation increases by about 9%, right, or 9.3%. Um, and that would be substitution from ebooks to physical books. Now, because ebook circulation is so much smaller than physical circulation, total circulation doesn't change all that much. Um, putting all of this together, 
and calculating our consumer surplus and librarian surplus, and then also the consequent um, uh, library visits, we actually find that even if we remove ebooks altogether, consumers are only hurt a little. They're only hurt by about like 3.8%. Um, librarian utility, that's a little tricky, so I think I'd rather talk a little more about the library visits. And it turns out library visits would increase because we found that ebooks holdings would actually decrease uh, library, uh, library visits. Uh, now to get to the most interesting part, and again, keeping an eye on the time, um, what we have is now if we double our ebook prices, so to go from twice as expensive as physical books to four times as expensive as physical books, we'll find that uh, librarians would actually increase their physical holdings by about 20%, and decrease their ebook holdings by about uh, by over 50 percent, 58 percent. Um, that would, in turn, you know, given the model that we that I showed with the uh, with the indifference curves, it does allow for the potential that um, consumers actually consumer utility increases. It turns out it pretty much remains the same on average, right? Um, and in fact, you know, we'd see more library visits. So this seems kind of like net positive except for how librarians feel about this right so and then finally just kind of to show you know the librarians if they change their preferences if we force them to value circulation of each format as much exactly the same as uh, as consumers we would see that they would increase the library holdings significantly a lot for the physical holdings and they have very few ebook holdings um, that in turn would increase consumer surplus by about 2.4%. So we'd actually see quite a big, like a relatively large increase in consumer surplus, assuming that that would be possible. Now, uh, I do kind of, you know, we can kind of summarize this overall as, you know, uh, going through this very quickly in, in the interest of time, um, that, you know, if we look at the, the change in visits, which is on the y-axis here, the more we restrict ebook access, the more people go to the libraries not a big surprise given our reduced form results. The more we liberate uh, ebook access, the lower the, the number of visits. On the x axis here, I'm showing like the, no, the number of like uh, the, the change in consumer surplus. Here's our zero. It turns out if we remove ebooks all to, uh, if we remove physical books altogether, that's a huge blow to uh, consumer surplus. Uh, generally, if we print limit print books, we see a big decrease in consumer surplus. But if we expand print books, we actually see an increase in consumer surplus. Uh, now, briefly, our model, our results are robust, both, both to our estimated uh, correlation parameters from the demand model and also to the assumed ratio of ebook versus physical book prices. I'm happy to talk more about that, um, but I also want to hear more questions. And so, right for now, kind of as a takeaway, libraries are less threatened than they think, in fact. So that's what we'll find, and I'll leave it at that. So thank you. All right, yeah. thanks. We do have lots of questions. Yes. So Let me start. I have a question. Just it's really an uh, elementary question. Just trying to understand how eBooks are checked out. Um, you don't have to physically go there. Yeah. You can just do it. And and so could I check an eBook out of the New York Public Library? And what what is the role for a local public library yeah. in a world of eBooks? What a wonderful question. Um, so. You don't have to go to the library, but you do need a library membership. Now, if I, I, I have tried recently to get access to the Minneapolis Hennepin County Library, um, I would have to give them a Minneapolis or like a Twin Cities address. But other than, like that's the only thing. So if I were willing to just lie about that, I'm pretty sure I could easily get access to to the Minneapolis Library. And, and the same there, for others. For some reason, libraries wouldn't become like superstar providers, like like. Right. Big librarians. Yeah. I mean, like, I guess the New York Public Library or someone else could say, okay, we're going to just yeah. go national like the New York Times did. <laughs> so, I mean, clearly, so, so the idea is, okay, if we have, in fact, um, I mean, th that is, in fact, one of our counterfactuals that kind of shows up, um, you know, in this world here where we top, top up ebooks. Um, that is, in fact, a world where we do exactly that. We assume that every, everybody has access to the biggest ebook library overall. Um, now, the, the thing that probably prevents us from doing that is publishers suing you. So actually, in fact, right now, right, the, the Internet Archive, uh, for example, is being sued by the like by four of the major publishers um, 
about exactly making books available, but actually, actually they didn't even necessarily, yeah. Like, but publishers don't have an interest in, in allowing that to happen. So you, you could, some of them, you can only take out one ebook at it. I mean, one exactly. copy at a time, right? So yeah. you still, publishers would still get just, yeah. yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, there are a number of questions here uh, yeah. uh, online, so let me get to some of them. Um, sure. JJ Lee and GG Johnson, these are two different people, <laughs> uh, have a similar question. Um, JJ asks, is, is it possible that, and this relates to the, to the earlier question, um, that, that, the for, that the types of books that are ebooks versus print books are different? For instance, yeah. more popular bestsellers might be, um, say, he posits yeah. um, print books and maybe the more obscure or maybe you know, expensive ones. Or, or earlier I was talking about kids' books. I don't think there's that many kids' books that are ebooks, and maybe there are. Yeah. So you could imagine those being different. And, and uh, Gigi's related questions. Well, she asserts that ebook trends are, are very different for fiction and nonfiction, um, and whether they're in the top five or ten or not. Yeah. So this also gets to this question about the, 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 the different kinds of books. And, and let me just add a, a, a yeah. piece to the mix there is, you know, to, I, I think you don't have the titles, but if you could get the, the, the exact same titles, you might get a different story than if you're having different titles. So I guess the broader question that from all yeah. of these is, is how much of this is driven by different kinds yeah. of content in ebook versus physical books versus different usage patterns, or, or what do you exactly. think is driving some of those results? Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, those are all really good questions, right? And I, and I definitely put down overall, at least for the one library for which we observe the whole, like the actual titles that we're holding, uh, that'd be nice to, it would nice, it'd be nice for us to actually look into uh, which, like, how popular, where, where do they show up on the bestseller list? Do they show up on the bestseller list? Uh, now, overall, and, and this is more like a, you know, sample size one kind of thing, where if I go to my, uh, you know, local library in, in Boston, not, not the Boston Public Library, but like the Minutemen Library, um, I definitely have access to all of the top, uh, top bestsellers via ebook as well. So my, my general sense is that these are, it's not that the ebooks are all just really low quality books. I like my sense is that they are actually high quality books. Now, uh, but that said, yeah. In fact, though, also, I'm. While I think this is very, very interesting, it, it seems a lot like the, the the substitution patterns that we see wouldn't necessarily be too affected by, or. Or I mean, the, the, rather the substitution patterns that we do see are in fact substitution patterns that we see, right? So, so if they are, what what I kind of like summarizing the questions that I hear is like, do we see these strong substitution patterns because the books are the same, or is there something else going on? Um, and uh, yeah, I don't quite know the answer to that, but um, uh, but but in terms of what we find for our overall result, I don't think that this would really change our main finding in the paper so okay great uh, i think there's a question mm -hmm. over there i'm sorry let me i guess i'll bring this over to you oh we've got two I don't know if that mic was working try it yeah <laughs> um so i was part of a library that split up its ebook collection so it was previously part of the northern california digital library okay and now it's like a separate now the sunnyvale library has its own ebook collection is that something that's commonly happening? Like, so what Eric was talking about in terms of the consortium, for yeah. sure the New York Public Library is a big consortium because yeah. it has that many patrons. Um, is there, like, because physical libraries have that space constraint, is this behavior sort of going on? I just have this one anecdotal yeah. example of it happening in this area. So. So, so one thing that I that I that that what you you guys are reminding me of now is as well. Of course, even for physical books, we have interlibrary loans that also happen that that create the same kind of consortium. Yeah. Um, now, I'm not sure how common it is that libraries break up like you described. I'm I really just don't know. Um, but it'll be interesting to 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 see and also what 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 that actually would imply. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, one more question online. Uh, uh, Linda Salman asks, uh, what are the differences, what are the data show about the differences between large and small libraries or library systems yeah. other than simply scale? Like, are there differences in the kinds of yeah. titles they hold, et cetera? So, okay, so, so in general, I like the question. Uh, now, again, what we can talk about a little bit is, is uh, at least, I mean, actually, yeah, we do know the holdings. Now, now, it turns out if we do draw 
So if we estimate the demand model separately for like large cities and small cities, the substitution patterns are very similar across these different split samples. Um, the, the, the estimated thetas happen to, to kind of vary a little more, like the estimated like weights that librarians attach to uh, physical versus ebook circulation. They change a little bit more, or they, they, there are some patterns between small and big libraries. Um, I, but, I, but I'm blanking a little bit on, on what exactly these patterns were. In general, we would, of course, think that maybe for rural, more rural libraries or smaller libraries, that maybe uh, they value ebooks more because, well, you know, then they don't have to drive as far, or, but it could also go the other way. So um, I'll, I'll have more to say about that very soon as well. So I apologize for a half answer here. Okay. Yeah. Other, other questions? Yep. Right over there. So, yeah. Thanks a lot. Um, I'm just wondering about the role of Amazon in the system, for example. So because uh, just to understand the, the market better, so are publishers yeah. and authors allowed to, or do they have to choose between publishing their ebook in this, these public libraries and on Amazon? And because this might affect the composition of ebooks as well, and or ebooks versus physical. Yeah. And the so, second question related to this is um, about the substitution from ebooks to physical books. So whether people or customers then rather uh, substitute ebooks which are not or no longer available at the, the public library just by purchasing them, them themselves on Amazon or wherever. I see. Um, yeah, we'll take that one. So, so first of all, yeah. So with Amazon titles, so so note that you can definitely publish your title on Kindle, like say through Penguin Random House or something, and also make it available on Kindle. And then it can also be on the public library. So that's that's not the issue. It's 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 books that are published through Kindle, like through an actual Kindle, like an Amazon owned publisher. So that there is a decision. Now overall though, because we don't see because we see kind of these re really strong substitution patterns within and across um, uh, formats. I don't think that the outside market, I think it's perfectly fine that we don't observe the outside market and treat e uh, libraries kind of as, as a separate uh, product. And uh, maybe I see Eric there, but if you can remind me of the second question, give me like one uh, keyword. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, exactly. I think these are kind of related. So I think maybe, yeah, exactly. I think, I think they're closely enough related that that i feel like we're, we're probably getting to to that point there yeah but thank you yeah all right all right thank you so much imke i'm afraid yeah. we're out of time so we appreciate right. you sharing that research with us all right <laughs> thank and uh please yeah. join us uh next week for the digital economy lunch seminar when we're having hima lakaraju of harvard business school joining us so we'll see you then thanks very much bye